Okay, so I'm Andrea Mansker. Um, I uh, teach at Sewanee University of the South. I'm in the history department and I'm also currently chair of Women and Gender Studies. So I hope to uh, introduce a new element to our discussion, which is uh, gender and also France. Um, in 1869, the feminist travel writer, journalist, and public speaker Olympe Oduar judged herself insulted by a few lines published in the conservative newspaper Le Figaro. A brief report on one of her recent lectures on women's emancipation, the piece accused her of being such an ineffective and inarticulate speaker that the small audience present for her talk laughed in her face while others whistled at her. Taking her complaint directly to the paper's audacious director, Henri de Via Misson, himself no stranger to the dueling field, Odoir alerted him that due to the anonymous personal insult made against her in the columns of Le Figaro, quote, I judge that my honor as a woman and as a writer required a reparation. I asked you for your day and hour, end quote. <laughs> This was, one <laughs> um, this was one of a number of high-profile dueling challenges made by French feminists in these years. Odoir, like other individuals who issued provocations to male journalists and editors, opted for this violent solution due to Muckraker's unchecked libel of any woman who attempted to forge a public persona. Framing Le Figaro's insult as one that not only affected her personally, but that outraged all women writers, Odoir expressed her belief that as long as women were excluded from the masculine point of honor, they would not be taken seriously as political actors. So in issuing her cartel, Odoir enacted a popular script, I argue, increasingly used by French men in this period, one which followed a discernible pattern of language, gestures, and values of the extra-legal honor system. This system thrived in France during a prolonged era that witnessed the rise of republicanism as the dominant focus of the nation's political loyalties, as well as the spectacular growth of the mass press from the uh, late 1860s. Historians of modern France have demonstrated how the exclusive aristocratic honor culture was retained and democratized by bourgeois men after the French Revolution of 1789. The revolutionaries proclaimed an end to privilege and initiated liberal economic and political policies that favored individualism. But scholars argue that the public code of honor remained the exclusive prerogative of men and became a key way of defining masculinity prior to the Great War. Odoir faced the problem of inserting herself into the increasingly contentious and competitive world of journalism. But she also exploited the contradictions of this Republican moment of the late 1860s to expand the boundaries of the public honor code and to redefine liberalism in practice to include women. The paradox of liberal democracy in France was that it championed universal suffrage and individual rights, but continued to look to the seemingly anachronistic ritual of the duel to settle conflicts over personal reputation. While the Third Republic failed to grant women full civil and civic rights, the honor code treated them as weak physical beings whose reputation was defended by the men in their families. Uh, in this paper, I suggest that approaching French honor from the perspective of individuals considered marginal to the code demonstrates a more flexible and nuanced understanding of its gendered boundaries among contemporaries than scholars have recognized. Odoir outlined her grievances against Via Masson in a letter published by Le Figaro shortly after the issue containing the insulting review. She indicated that after a number of friends had drawn her attention to the uh, incriminating passage, she presented herself at the paper's office in Paris. She asked a staff member to convey the message to Via Misson, who was reportedly uh, away from the capital, that the article in question was completely inaccurate and she wanted a retraction. In response to the journal's characterization of her as a bad speaker, Odouard admitted that though she might have been a poor conferencière, Quote, what is certain is that my audience listened to me with the most courteous attention for one and a half hours, and that it had the benevolence to applaud me much more than my weak talent merited, end quote. In reply to the paper's accusation that Odouard failed to attract a large audience to her talk, she made it clear that, quote, my room was full, end quote. Upon hearing her complaint, Via Misson replied, this is possible, but I will not rectify it. The refusal of Le Figaro's editor-in-chief to publicly correct his journalist's false statements prompted Odouard to escalate the conflict and to invoke the language of honor more directly. 
she explained to Via Masson that not only was the review inaccurate, but it was, quote, rude and impertinent, end quote. Such a base attack on her character demanded a reparation by arms. In her insistence that Via Masson settle the conflict violently on the dueling terrain, Odouar appealed to both legal and extra-legal codes. She reminded her adversary of his legal responsibilities as Le Figaro's director. The press laws of the Second Empire required a paper's editor-in-chief uh, to not only personally sign every number of the newspaper, but to insert the responses of any person named or designated therein in the following edition and typically within three days. Um, if directors refused to publish the letter in a timely fashion, they could face a fine of anywhere from 50 to 500 francs, which is pretty steep, uh, and possibly other penalties and damages to which the original incriminating article gave rise. Le Figaro's disparaging remarks about Oduard's speaking ability might have constituted defamation of character were she to pursue him in court, which was an option. Odouard thereby recalled to Villemesson his legal obligations as the paper's director, which made him responsible for all content in his publication. According to the law, however, Villemesson fulfilled his duty by printing Odouard's letter within the required time frame. What he refused to do was to publish a rectification to an article that Odouard considered not only false, but as damaging to her public reputation as a speaker. Though Odouard reminded Via Masson of the law, she immediately clarified in her published letter she had no intention of taking her adversary to court. This was suggested by her demand that he specify his day and hour. By indicating that she would settle for nothing less than a duel in the absence of a retraction, Odouard implied that Le Figaro's insult to her honor was so damaging it could only be settled by violence. Hence, the Odouard via Masson affair explains how and why a personal conflict in the increasingly liberal world of journalism under the Second Empire could require an extra legal solution. The press was undergoing a dramatic shift in the late uh, 1860s. During most of the imperial period, the government imposed heavy censorship on newspapers uh, through a series of decrees that required directors to apply for government authorization and also to pay a large amount of caution money if they wanted to found political papers. Um, in 1868, as part of his attempt to liberalize the regime, Napoleon III agreed to a new press law that allowed any man enjoying his civil and political rights to establish a paper without prior government approval. Within one year, 140 new papers uh, were created in Paris alone as the result of the law. Even in the earlier 1860s, however, there had been a proliferation of periodicals that used their non-political status to avoid paying caution money. In 1863, the entrepreneur and journalist Polydor Millot began a penny press revolution uh, when he launched Le Petit Journal, a daily non-political paper in reduced format that sold for five centimes, bringing it within the reach of the masses. Le Figaro is a good example of this non-political press under the Second Empire, characterized by its rumor mongering and its general desire to distract. Via Masson, the founder and animating spirit of the publication, was known as a businessman already responsible for establishing a number of failed newspapers uh, when he revived Le Figaro in 1854. He was widely criticized by contemporaries uh, for his methods of selling papers, uh, accused of trading in insults and even blackmailing his enemies. The paper often mercilessly targeted specific victims, and Via Masson was, himself was frequently brought to court or onto the dueling terrain because of the things that were written in his uh, newspaper. Due to these democratic de developments, the journalistic world was increasingly regulated by the point of honor. In moving beyond the threat of legal action to a call to arms based on a journalistic slur, Odouard was on solid ground according to the 19th century dueling manuals. Historian Robert Nye has shown that in spite of the principle that honor constituted an implicit unwritten code, uh, detailed instruction booklets abounded in France uh, from the seminal publication of the Comte du Chateau Villard's essay on the duel in 1836. French men viewed Chateau Viard's book as an authoritative guide to the rules governing the practice, and it attained a quasi-legal status in civil and criminal courts. The press was not the principal concern in Chateau Viard's day that it would become later in the century. Uh, correspondingly, one can see in the proliferation of dueling guides from the 1870s a prominent consideration of journalists and uh, editors' personal obligations when faced with readers' charges of libel. 
These unofficial rules were often more rigorous than the law during the Third Republic, uh, suggesting a higher value placed on public reputation by participants. As the 1900 advice for duels by the Prince Georges Bibesco and Duke Ferry de Sclon made clear, quote, any person insulted in a periodical will be able to demand reparation either from the article's author or from the editor-in-chief of the paper at his choice. End quote. A proper mode of satisfaction when outraged like this, as the manuals made clear, was, quote, either a retraction or of his affronts or a reparation by arms, end quote. In adhering to the rules and regulations of the point of honor, Oduar did what any man might do who found himself libeled in a similar fashion. The problem with her challenge and the main reason Villamisson did not take her seriously as an adversary was her sex. Many of the responses that Oduar received from Le Figaro and from other male journalists demonstrate the masculine boundaries of the public honor and the ridicule that a woman experienced when she attempted to access such an exclusive domain. Though Villemessant printed Oduard's response to his perceived slight to her honor, he refused to grant her satisfaction through extra-legal means. His reply to her request for a reparation was that he would not fight a woman. Villemessant nonetheless appointed Le Figaro's journalist, Jules Richard, to serve as his intermediary to handle the affair in his absence. According to Oduar, Richard listened to her grievance with the, quote, courtesy of a gallant man, end quote, but echoed Villemessant in asserting he would not cross swords with a woman. Richard, Richard then gave her the option of having a man fight in her place, thus invoking the idea of a substitute. Dueling manuals throughout the 19th century had specified that minors, along with old or incapacitated men, required that their able-bodied male relatives stand in for them on the terrain. Significantly, authors of these guides did not feel compelled to specifically mention the, quote, n the need to, quote, protect the honor of a woman without defenders, end quote, and that is a quote from a dueling manual after the 1870s. Um, or to provide a male substitute for a woman who delivered a public insult herself until the 1870s. The novel inclusion of specific instructions for such situations suggests both an augmentation in the number of offended single women who lacked men in their families to defend them, as well as an increase in the number of women who sought to participate autonomously in the point of honor. When the manuals did begin to mention these possibilities, they sought to preclude women by equating them with minors, old men, and the physically disabled. Though Villemessant and Richard treated Oduar in a strictly legal manner, Le Figaro inserted an insulting poem about her written by Albert Mio directly after Oduar's letter of repost. Derisively presenting his poem as the official response to Madame Olympe Oduar, Mio openly mocked her pretensions to speak the language of male honor and to fashion herself as a female duelist. Quote, I am the one who will respond, madame, to your virulent style. It is in verse that one speaks to a woman. You see how gallant we are, end quote. Mio scoffed not only at her attempt to demonstrate masculine courage, but at what he saw as her desire to revive bygone traditions of medieval chivalry. Gallantry, he implied, had been destroyed in current times by virulent women like Oduar, who tried to establish public identities as writers and who adopted the combative style and idiom of the duel. Sexualizing her and making it clear which qualities excluded her from active combat, Mio continued, quote, In this duel, I must say to you, one of the fighters would be duped, madame, for the target is more developed in you, end quote. In this allusion to Oduard's breasts, Mio made it clear that her physiology as a woman was the primary hindrance to her viability as an adversary. In medical and popular thought, women were held to be weaker than men and their bodies subject to irregular fluctuations based on their biological cycles. This was reflected in the dueling manuals, provision of a male substitute, and Oduard commented on this assumption numerous times in her writings. As she stated sarcastically in her 1866 book, War on Men, which highlighted men's repeated slander and calumniation of women writers, quote, Monsieur, it is well and truly war that I declare on you. I attack what is stronger than me. I attack the strong sex, whereas I belong to the weak sex. I must therefore have for me men of courage always ready to rescue the weak against the strong, end quote. 
A woman's need for protection was a principal justification for the honor code, and her reputation, primarily sexual, was supposed to be safeguarded by the men in her family. Much of the language Mio and others used to describe Oduart's public persona invoked the blue stocking stereotype, which was linked to women's re-emerging identities as feminists and public figures during a period of liberal reform. As Mio admonished her in a rather unimaginative stanza, quote, since one says that your intellect shines, remove your dreadful blue stockings, be a mother of the family, and look after the stew, end quote. Writers and caricaturists deployed the Bablu label from the first half of the 19th century to address the literary prominence of female writers such as Georges Sand and Marie d'Agoul. Honoré Daumier's caricatures of blue stockings in the 1840s depicted them as ugly, unsexed, domineering, neglectful of their domestic responsibilities, and ridiculous in their intellectual pretensions. Daumier and others played on and inverted the axiom that genius has no sex by suggesting that any woman who pursued literary or intellectual activities in the public sphere proved, in fact, that genius was sex, belonging exclusively to men. As Whitney Walton points out, the stereotype thrived in a context of anxiety and important changes in publishing and journalism under the July monarchy and earlier regime. Technological and commercial innovations in printing allowed larger numbers of women writers to publish their works, but also created more competition among journalists for jobs. As a result, many male writers attributed a supposed decline in literary quality and also commercialization to the increased presence of female authors. So a similar dynamic appeared to be at work in the last years of the Second Empire uh, when the government relaxed not only the press laws but began to reintroduce freedom of association. Prior to this, women were banned from giving public speeches, um, in addition to the prohibition against addressing political topics in periodicals. As freedom of assembly was extended, public lectures, or conférences as they were called, uh, became important features of the French political landscape. The reappearance of the female journalist and conferencière in this period appeared to be a novel and unusual phenomenon to contemporaries. Along with feminists such as Maria de Rem, uh, Louise Michel, and André Léo, Oduar became one of the first women in this period to speak publicly on women's rights. By the late 1860s, she had established her reputation as an activist writer and world traveler, publishing a number of books about her extensive journeys in Egypt, Turkey, and the U.S. As Rachel Nunez demonstrates, Oduar used the liberal concept of cosmopolitanism in these travelogues to expose and criticize the legal, political, and social condition of French women. Often delivering speeches on women's rights to accompany her books, Oduar's public identity in the literary world and her self-publicity and willingness to travel independently linked her to the blue stocking stereotype in the public mind. Her dueling provocation simply confirmed for many writers the bas bleu, or blue stockings, challenge to male privilege and public prerogatives. So many of the journalistic responses to Oduard's affront, in fact, emphasized it as a desperate, frivolous publicity stunt that she orchestrated to gain exposure for her subpar books and lectures. The satirical paper La Tenta Mar attributed this self-realization to her, quote, I could publish 80 volumes a year and I would never succeed in attracting public attention. I will knock over my inkwell and seek a noisier advertisement than that of talent and work. And taking her strong head into her hands, Madame Oduard found an idea that will probably furnish Cremio and Hervé buffoonery uh, for next winter. She seeks to fight a duel. At present, Madame Odoir wanders through the editorial offices, a box of pistols under her arm, and asks for a journalist who wants to line up with her. The person is not important to her. Above all, she wants blood and victims, end quote. Latinta Marsh suggested that Odoir's cartel was yet another feminist ploy to attract the attention of journalists always on the hunt for the next sensationalist story. She tried to mimic the behavior of men in appropriating the language and gestures of the honor system but her willingness to fight the first man who came along, regardless or, what, of, or, or not of whether he had insulted her, demonstrated her complete misunderstanding of the code. Her provocation, the author implied, was not based on a deep feeling of personal injury, but was all for show. Um, central to her preoccupation was the celebrity status she hoped to obtain from her theatrical display, and thus she was driven by a shameful feminine desire for material gain. Yet, accusing Oduart of shallowness and a quest for self-publicity was ironic, 
considering the meaning and function of the honor code for French men in this era. Central to practically all honor grievances was the accusation of lying. To give the lie to an individual meant to challenge his word and his self-constructed persona as an honest man. As historians have demonstrated, the point of the duel was not to determine the truth of any insult or to dig beneath the surface of appearances to some underlying reality. Rather, it was to suggest you would not allow another person to call into question the public identity that you projected of yourself. While individuals outraged in the French press may have wanted some version of the truth to be reflected in the editor's rectification, the duel itself certainly did not establish or discredit the veracity of any claim. Rather, the duel verified that the individual had the ability and will to defend her public reputation from defamation and prove the duelist equality with her opponent. When a man showed that he was willing to risk his life on the field of honor, this was expected to silence his opponents and protect his good name. In Odoard's case, the perceived insult had been over her abilities as a feminist speaker. At stake was her self-constructed persona as a talented conferencier and writer in the combative world of journalism. She had spent her career up to this point carefully crafting this self-image and was attracting large paying crowds to her lectures by this time. Her speeches were also frequently reviewed and praised in the press. In seeking publicity through the duel and trying to defend her reputation as a public figure, she was acting in the same manner as did French men of honor. The duel was, as Kenneth Greenberg makes clear in his study of the Old South, quote, a theatrical display for public consumption and the parties expected descriptions of the events to be widely circulated, end quote. This observation is equally accurate for France in these decades when dueling manuals specified the all-important role of public opinion in determining the point of honor and when both parties essentially outlined their grievances in full in the press. In enacting the script of the dueling affair and revealing that a woman could adhere to its rules, Odouard exposed both the superficiality of the French interpretation of honor and its changing and constructed nature. Furthermore, she noted, many women in the modern era did not have men to duel in their stead, alluding to the reality of increasing numbers of single professional women who threatened the honor code's gendered exclusivity. She explained, quote, I am a widow, and I no longer have either a father nor a brother. This means that it falls to me alone to ensure that my dignity and honor are respected, end quote. The idea of a male substitute, she made clear, was a prejudice, quote, I will not tolerate a gratuitous impertinence, and I persist in demanding a reparation from you, either in writing or by the pistol. As for the rest, to place your sensitive nature at ease, I will tell you that I know how to handle a firearm, and that a bullet, whether fired by a female or male hand, kills just the same." End quote. Odor made it clear that she was willing to risk her life to have her reputation respected, and that she was no shrinking violet who had never handled weapons. In fact, Odouard had been taught to use guns by her father as a child and continued to hunt as an adult. Odouard's gendered challenge to the code um, and her reference to journalists' lack of chivalry may not have convinced her adversaries that they should take up pistols uh, against women. But she did expose some of the um, new democratic social conditions and realities to which the honor code struggled to adapt. Her critique revealed the contradictions of maintaining the noble practice of the duel in a republican society that challenged the imperial rule of Napoleon III and professed its firm belief in liberal democracy. This conflict was given voice by the major critic Odouard faced in the wake of her provocation, the royalist writer and literary critic Barbie de Orvilly. In his published response to Odouard's actions in the conservative paper Le Gaulois, Barbie d'Orvilly continued along the lines of Millot in his mockery of his feminist rival. Yet, rather than simply highlight Odouard's perversion of the point of honor, Barbie d'Orvilly used her provocation to make a larger comment about the anachronism of the duel in an increasingly democratized society. If he wrote, quote, the coachman is your equal, if the domestic servant is your equal, as the noblemen were among themselves, if women are our equals, there is nothing to say or to laugh at. One must fight the coachman, the servant, and even Madame Odouard, end quote. Odouard, he argues, was simply, quote, the most advanced, best armed expression of the women's right to civil, political, and social equality. And I will end there, <laughs> so I think probably over time.